So um, what else is good for us is when we dig into God's word, right, which is what we're going to do right now. So I'm really proud of you guys being here on this glorious morning, which you could be walking somewhere, and I'm glad that you are here. So we are digging into Ephesians 1. We're going to go into the how Paul prayed for the believers, okay, in the church of Ephesus. Remember, we, he just went through and talked to us about the position we are in Christ and all the spiritual blessings that we have in God the Father, in God the Son, and in God the Holy Spirit, right? We have spiritual blessings, Way, 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 way better than what? Than just temporal blessings, right? We have them now, and we'll have them for all of eternity. We have them through God the Father, right? We, have, we are chosen, we're predestined, and we are accepted in his Son. Spiritual blessings as a believer. As, as a believer, through Jesus Christ, we have redemption, we have forgiveness, and we have an inheritance, Forever and ever and ever. And then we learned last week through the Holy Spirit, the spiritual blessings, is that he's the one that quickens us, right? He's the one who makes us alive. Okay, you guys don't look too alive this morning yet. Okay, but he does. He makes us alive, right? He quickens us. He quickens us, right? And we learned how we are sealed until the day of redemption. So he's our deposit. He's our earnest money, right? That it's will never leave us until we see Jesus face to face. Right, so we have all of these spiritual blessings. So Paul, as the preacher to the church of Ephesus, was sharing this with him and preaching this to him, but also then he was a praying preacher, which is the best ever, right? We, you should, your pastor should be praying for you. So we're going into the area where he's now praying for them that they would know this that they would know these spiritual blessings, that they would know how to walk in these. Because remember the three words in Ephesians, right? The first one is what? Sit, is sit, right? We know our position. We're seated in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ. The next one is walk, right? That we know that we practice, we live out our faith here on earth, and he teaches us how to do that in and through Ephesians. And the last one is what? Stand, and that's how we stand against the wiles of the devil, right? So we have on God's armor, and he's the one fighting for us. All we need to do is be still, and we stand. And so Paul is, is digging in deeper because he, he has this agape love, just like he did for the church at Corinth. Remember last year, that agape love that he just kept walking toward him, walking toward him? The difference is, is that the church of Corinth was like, now... No thanks, no thanks. We like these false apostles. We like these guys who look good. We like these guys who are great orders. We, right? And Paul just kept walking toward him and walking toward him with agape love. The church of Ephesus loved him back, loved him back. So he was walking toward them in agape love, and the church of Ephesus was loving him back. And so there's a, there a big, big difference there. So I want you to open up your Bible or your smart device, whatever it is that you have, and I'm going to read uh, 3 through 14, which we've covered, and then we're going to dig into 15 and forward. And this is uh, in the NIV. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in who? In Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Holy, set apart for his purpose. Blameless doesn't mean perfection. It means you live above reproach. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Verse 11. 
In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When does the Holy Spirit come and live in you? When you believe, right? When, when you believe. When you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, that he died for your sin, not just for the whole world, which he did, but you personally could have kept him on that cross, and you believe that, and you ask forgiveness, and you want to follow him the rest of your days. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you at that moment. And you're sealed. When you believed, you're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, let's go into uh, verse 15 and forward. For this reason, now this is Paul speaking again, right? For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, meaning the believer's faith at the church of Ephesus, in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Let's just stop there for a minute. So that you may know him better. Now, Paul is praying in, like, in light of God's ultimate plan that he has and this, this declaration that he's giving of thanksgiving to God. And so, so he's, he's, he's praying because he has already shared about the work of the triune God and the spiritual blessings that he has already given to us, okay? And now he's giving this amazing statement of prayer and declaration of thanksgiving for the believers, for the believers and how they're walking and how they're believing, okay? And so he said, look, after I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints in the New King James, because a saint is a believer, you're either a saint or a... Ain't, that's right, okay. So he says, after I heard all that. Now, when Paul heard of the faith and love of the Ephesians, okay, he could do nothing else but give thanks for them. He, was, he, he gave thanks to God the Father for them because they were following in the footsteps of acknowledging these spiritual blessings and then and then having this faith and love between one another, not just to God the Father, right, through Jesus Christ, but between each other, in the body of Christ, in the church, okay? And so, now, their faith and love were evidence then in the participation of the work of God, just like yours is. Your faith, your love, is evidence of the participation of the work of God in your life. And that's what he was giving thanks for. Because they were actually joining God in what he was doing. Right? And so he was giving thanks because this faith and love that they're showing to each other, right, is evidence that they're joining in in God's plan and walking in these spiritual blessings. Okay? So... Remember, faith and love uh, don't earn us participation in this great work of God. It doesn't earn us anything, okay? They're evidence that we're participating in God's plan, right? We can't earn anything, right? God did everything for us. I mean, if, if, if God wouldn't have sent his son to reveal himself to us, we wouldn't be found, we wouldn't be found. He's the one who initiated everything. He's the one who came after me, came after you. He's the one who wants a relationship with you. He's the one in his great and glorious and grand plan where Jesus came to show himself to us as God. And he is God. All man, all God. Okay, and so he said, and I love how you, Paul is 
praying, and he's like, and I, and I see you have love for all the other believers or all the other saints, not just for God, but for all the other believers, okay? So that's a, that's a big deal. It's, it's easier to say, oh, I'm so grateful, so grateful that you love God and, 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 and you know Jesus, and I'm giving praise to him for that. It's another thing when you see in the body of Christ in the church loving each other. Right? Sinners all saved by grace, loving each other. That's evidence of God at work in you. And Paul's like, yes, yes. And that's what he's praying. He's praying that, you know, and the love that you have for all the saints. Because that's the real evidence of God's work in us. Not the love that we claim that we have for him, but the love we have for each other. The love that we have for each other. Now, other people can see that. And 1 John 4.20, 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. That person is a liar. For if we don't love people we see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Those who love God must love fellow believers. And I don't know about you, but, you know, all of us are unlovely. You do know that, right? We're all unlovely. Thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit as believers who live in us, and he is, he is everything, right? And we need to yield to him moment by moment by moment to be lovely, right? But Jesus came to love the what? The unlovely. How many of you are unlovely? Right? It's like, and so when, when Paul is seeing how they're loving one another, that agape love, this isn't the family love. This isn't the feely love. This isn't obviously Eros love. This is, this is agape love. He is praying and he is rejoicing because he sees their faith and their love for each other. John 13, 34 and 35 says, Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love one another. It proves you are my disciple, Jesus says. It proves you are my disciple. Now, Paul is not only giving thanks um, for God's work among them, among the Ephesians, he also prayed that it would continue with greater strength. It would continue with greater strength. And so he's mentioning that in verses 17 through 23. It makes it very clear. Okay, and I love this. That Paul is this um, amazing apostle and preacher and all these different mission trips, setting up churches. And he's not just um, preaching, which is what he's called to do, but he's the praying preacher. He knows like there's no power without prayer. He knows that prayer is the work. I mean, when he went to different churches uh, all, all around, um, it mentions in Rome, when he was in Rome, he often prayed. He, make, he made mention of others in prayer in uh, Romans 1.9. He mentioned the Christians in Rome, how he was praying for them. Uh, in uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, in Thessalonica, when he set up the church there, he goes and he prays for them there. Um, Philemon, he's, uh, he, in Philemon 1, he talks about how he's praying for them. And so he's, he's this praying preacher, right? I mean, nothing better. Because there's power, and then you're giving that over to him, knowing, God, if you don't do this, it can't be done. It can't be done. So Paul is praying that they would know God, that they would absolutely know God. So let's look at um, 17 again. <clears throat> let's read 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, what? You may know him better. So that you may know him better. Now, in the New King James, it starts out and it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought, I gotta, I gotta study this, Lori. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well... Paul's praying that we would know God, but, but Jesus is God. So how does this work? Because Jesus Christ himself is God. So why does he say the God of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
Well, what Paul is emphasizing here is the humanity of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's because of his humanity that we now have spiritual resources in him. It's because Jesus stepped out of eternity into time and became human for us, right? It was necessary for Jesus Christ to become flesh so he could reveal the Father to mankind, right? And so he talks it of, of his humanity here, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. John uh, 1.18 says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, capital O, meaning Jesus, who is himself God, and he's near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So without him becoming humanity, right, we would never know him, like I mentioned before. And so I love how he says, Paul is praying, I want you to know God. I want you to know him. And, he, and he's saying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So Paul prayed to the Father that he would give the believers a spirit of wisdom. Not, okay, in Revelation, not so that it would be, you know, we can take that and, and turn it into weird stuff, like, so that we could, like, look into the lives of others, or that we have, like, the ability to predict events, or that we, you know, want to do, um, I don't know, like, prophetic stuff, or prophet stuff. Or, he's not talking about that. He's not talking about that. He wanted them to have the spirit of wisdom, God's wisdom, right? So, he, he prayed that, that God's truth then would be illuminated so that you and I as believers could grasp its true significance. That it would be illuminated. And the Holy Spirit in us, one of his jobs is to illuminate our mind to God's wisdom, which is from above. And so Paul wanted believers. In other words, he's like, look, God wants to bestow this wisdom on you, and I'm praying that you will receive his wisdom, that you will know his wisdom. Not the wisdom of the world. Remember in James 1, we talked about the wisdom of the world? That's not what we're talking about. He's talking about, in James 3, 17, James talked about God's wisdom, which he says is what? First of all, pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's not easily provoked. It's full of mercy and good fruits. His wisdom is without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's what Paul's praying for the believers, for you and me as well. That we would know his wisdom. That we would walk through this world in his wisdom. Paul realized that only the Holy Spirit could effectually communicate spiritual truths to believers. And to know his wisdom. And to know his wisdom over and over and over again. And so he's like, I want you, I'm praying that you know God's wisdom so that you have better knowledge of him. Because when you have better knowledge of him, you trust him more. You know him more. Right? It's easier to do the next right thing because you are following hard after him. So in the knowledge of him, that, that word knowledge is full knowledge. In the Greek, it's full knowledge. It's not partial knowledge, okay? In other words, our, our, our Christian life needs to be centered around this purpose, to know God as, as he is in truth, as revealed by what? By his word as revealed by his word, and to correct our false, idolatrous ideals of who we've made God out to be. I don't know about you, but before um, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior at age 31, I had like my own God, right? This is how I made God to be, and this is who he is. Don't confuse me with the word of God or truth or facts, because this is, this is who God is, right? Like, like he was like a waiter, or he was like a magic god. Like, you know, anything, like I got in trouble or whatever, it's like, oh, 
You know, then you quick pray or whatever kind of thing, and then that's who he is. We, we made him into what we wanted to make him into. Until we come into a saving relationship through Jesus Christ. And then we begin to know him, know him, that word intercourse where he stops and I start, you can't tell the difference, know him. So you have his knowledge of him, right? And so we have, it, our, our Christian life needs to be centered around this purpose, to know God as he is in truth, as revealed by his word. Not what we make him out to be. Now, it's important to have like an accurate knowledge and understanding of who we are, but way more important to have an accurate knowledge and understanding of knowing who he is. Because then he reveals our calling, our purpose. And that's a good, good thing. Now let's look at verses 18 and 19. 18 and 19. Let's see, 17, 18 years. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Let's just stop there for a moment. Now, Paul is praying that they would understand everything God gave them in Jesus Christ. But what he's doing is he's praying that they understand all of these spiritual blessings, that they understand it, that they live it out. And so, you know, that's more than just salvation, that what we received in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's praying. He's like, look, we're to progress past the point of salvation. That's where it starts, is salvation. We're supposed to progress past the point of salvation in our Christian experience. In other words, it's supposed to be just spiritual birth, right? That's our starting place, but then it goes into spiritual maturity. We don't just stay a big fat baby. Do you guys remember Amy Grant's old, old song, Fat Baby? You're just a fat, 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 fat baby? It's hysterical. Google it. Don't do it now, but Google it. It is hysterical. You know, he was baptized, sanctified, redeemed by the blood. He's got the biggest King James Bible you'd ever see. It's hysterical, right? But the guy never, ever went past salvation. He stayed right there. He never grew into spiritual maturity, and it would be like a, a baby, right? You, a baby needs to grow in this, this, and have different nutrition and, and, and meat and solid foods and this, this, this kind of thing and, and grow up. You just don't want a great, big, huge, fat baby, right? And he said, and this is how a lot of us live. And Paul's praying, no, 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 that's not how we're to live. And how we're to grow into spiritual maturity is non-negotiable face-to-face time with Jesus. His word to be in his word, living, active word, which changes us from the inside out. Great to be under it like we are today, absolutely. But to be in the word every single day so he can work in you, work in you, and work out his calling in you. Nothing better. The primary way that we grow in understanding of God is through being in his word. Is through being in his word. Because it's not just a book. God spoke it. It's living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. will will go right deep, deep into us, which is a good thing, which is a very good thing. He gives us spiritual insight, right, when we take time to what? Be in the word. What does Psalm 119.18 say? It says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Meaning in the word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And then in verse 105 of Psalm 119, you probably know it. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? And a light unto my path. So he's, he's praying and he's saying, look, at, I, want, I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened, or, or, or so, so that you will know all that God has given you in Jesus Christ 
it's going to take supernatural work. It's not through logic. It's not through analytical, logical, trying to figure it out. It's going to take supernatural work. It will require the eyes of understanding being enlightened by the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Remember, he, we weren't left as orphans. He said, look, I'm going to leave, but before you know when I leave, another, another comforter, an advocate will come, Spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit, and he will live in you. Right? And so it's supernatural. It's supernatural. Hebrews 6, 1 says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward into maturity. Move past the elementary. We're going into middle school, heading into high school, going into college, doing master's, doing PhD, right? This is a good, good thing. It's supernatural with him. Paul used that great expression, actually, in, in New King James, where he said, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your heart. The heart is more of a literal, under, uh, literal word more than understanding. The eyes of your heart. And, and I think that too many of us as believers, too many of our hearts have no eyes. Are you following me? We have no eyes. In other words, places where we gain knowledge and, uh, and understanding. Okay, we have no eyes. And on the other hand, too many believers' eyes have no hearts. Right? In other words, God wants both of those to be combined in us. Right, that the eyes of our understanding of our heart would be enlightened. That's supernatural. That's spending time in his word. That's letting him speak to you and us responding. The word heart in scripture doesn't mean you're thump, 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 thump. Okay, it means your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your person. It's your person. It signifies the very core. It signifies the very center of life where where intelligence has like um, this post of observation. It, 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 it's your person. It's, it's where the stores of experience are laid up. That's your heart. It's your mind, your will, and emotions. It's like where your thoughts have their fountain from, their, from your mind. That's what he's talking about, the, your person, the heart. And so... Paul goes on and he prays that they would know three things. That they would know three things. Okay, let's go back to um, 18 again. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. There's one, right? That they would know the hope to which he has called you that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. There's two, right, that they would know that. And then, thirdly, and that they would know his incomparably great power for, those, for us who believe. Okay, those are the three uh, things that he wants them to know. The first one, when he says that you would know the hope of your calling. You would know this. Paul wanted them to know this. Few things give us a more secure and enduring hope in life than simply knowing God's called you. God has called you. He's called you. And he has a specific calling for you to fulfill as a believer. He's called you. Before the creation of time, he chose you, and now he's called you. You guys, steep on this a minute. God Almighty has called you and has a calling for you right now. And Paul is praying that for us, that you would know that, that you would walk in that. And you know, that, that hope of his calling, too, also involves um, the future, right? Where, where it's like we have this glorious future 
part of our calling is that we have this glorious future, right? We have this future of complete resurrection. We have this future of eternal life started when we believed in Jesus Christ, but it goes on forever, right? We have this calling of freedom from sin eventually in the future. No sin tug. We have this calling of perfected justification. Right now, it's just as if we've never sinned, but then we'll have perfected justification. We have this calling of this glorious elevation that we're going to be above the angels themselves. You know that, right? Because he died for us. That's a big deal. And the angels are going, wah, hey, mm, what, wah. How great is that? You guys, that's, we not only have our calling now, we have our calling in the future. He called us. And we have our calling in the future, right? And we need to understand, it's a greater understanding of all that we have in Jesus Christ. Back in Ephesians 1, verse 4, when he said, we are chosen before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and without blame before him in love, right? So, so the power of the Godhead, the triune God, would be exercised until his plan and purpose, right, was revealed. And God is going to continue his work with believers as he has determined to do. He's called you. He's called me. We have a calling. God begins working on, in us at the time of salvation. And he continues to work together. What? For our good, right? Romans 8, 28 says. Throughout our whole lifetime. Romans 8, 28. He causes all things to work together for good. Why? With the purpose of becoming more and more like his son. Our calling. Becoming more and more like his son. more Being conformed to the likeness of his son. And then people are watching you. In fact, I was sharing this with somebody the other day. They're like, well, Mark, what is this? I'm like, well, you have a calling. I have a calling. You're like, what? I said, yeah. We have a calling. God called you know, us to do and to walk and to be. It's like, you know, we're it. We're his motley crew. This is it. Right? But I want people to see Jesus in me, not my, not my puke. I want them to see Jesus in me. And so he has this, you know, high calling on our, our, on our life. This high calling. Paul referred to the high calling upon his own life, which is my life first out of Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ. It makes me weep every time. I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Becoming like him in death. So that somehow I can attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. There's my calling. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. I want to know him. Just like Paul said. And when we, when we realize what God is trying to accomplish in our lives... It will give us a greater desire to obey Jesus Christ in everything that we do. In everything that we do. See, because our attitude will change. And when your attitude changes, our values change. The more we recognize what God wants to do in and through us. And it's not really all about me anymore. It's all about his calling. We've been called. And we have this calling, this great calling on us. As we walk through this earth as little dust balls that he's appointed to be here for such a time as this. We have a calling. I mean, think about Paul. Think about how he must have reflected on what he, on what he had in Jesus Christ in contrast to before him knowing Jesus Christ. Right? Right? 
I mean, he was killing Christians before, right? Okay, and so Philippians 3, 7 and 8 says this. This is Paul speaking. But whatever was gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Can you say that? Can I say that? But whatever was gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage, or he calls it dung, that I may gain Christ. What a calling. See, it's only as we grasp the hope of God's calling that we have a desire to know Jesus better, right? Then you have that desire, I want to know him. I want to know him more. I want to know him more and more and more. So that's the first thing that he was praying that they would know, the hope of God's calling in your life. The second thing was, is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the believers, in his saints. Now think about this. Paul wanted them to know the greatness of God's inheritance in his people. Now, we know we have this amazing inheritance in him, right? Forever and ever and ever. But he's saying, oh, no, 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 no. We usually think only of our inheritance in God. Meanwhile, Paul wanted the Ephesians to understand, you are so, so precious to God that he considers you his own inheritance. How great is that? We as believers are God's own inheritance. Remember last week we talked about it. We're trophies of grace. We're his trophies of grace. His undeserved favor. And we, he's so stinking excited about it that we are his inheritance. Not that we have the inheritance in Christ, but that he thinks that we are so precious, so precious, that we are considered his own inheritance. Now, when I think about that, when I think about my spiritual poverty, right? My spiritual poverty. I wonder how God can find any inheritance in me or any believer because of my spiritual poverty. And then I think, oh, wait a minute. God can make riches out of poor men and women because why? Because he invests much in them. He invests in them, right? He has invested riches of love, riches of wisdom, riches of suffering, riches of glory. These things accrue into a rich inheritance in us as believers. That's what he does. That's who he is. And he looks at us as these amazing, amazing trophies of grace, right? So we belong to God because why? Because he purchased us. We were bought at a price, right? 1 Corinthians 16, or I should say 6, 19. Remember it says, what? Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are bought at a price. It was Jesus' blood. God considers you and me as believers the greatest value in the universe. Do you look at yourself that way? Paul's praying for the believers that way. We're the greatest value in the universe. Not the planets, not the stars, not that he hung all of them, not that the glorious moon. We are. We are. You and me. The little dust balls he wants to have a love relationship with. How great is that? He created the universe by his might and power, but he purchased you and me with his blood.
a lot of value. That's a lot of love. And one day, this old world will be rolled up like a scroll. Rolled up like a scroll, and there'll be a new heaven, and there'll be a new earth. All this will be gone, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But we, who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, will go on forever. We'll go on forever. Once again, our calling. Once again, the inheritance that he has in us because he values us so much because we're trophies of his grace. Anybody ask who you are? You say, I'm a trophy of God's grace. Well, I sort of, you know, you're sort of, no, no, no. Word of God says that. Of his grace. Remember, it's undeserved favor. That's where a trophy of. Nothing that we've done. Everything that he's done for us because we were bought. We are bought at a price. So we need to know the hope of our calling, and that's what Paul was praying for. We need to know the riches of the glory of, the, of his, his inheritance in us as believers, right? And then lastly, the exceeding greatness, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. The exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Paul wanted them to know how great the power of God is toward us. That word power in the Greek, is dynamite. Not just little power. It's dynamite. It means the omnipotence of God. It means the all-powerfulness of God that we would know. The omnipotence, the all-powerfulness of God, the dynamite of God. So we should know that we serve and that we love a God of living power who does what? Who shows his strength on behalf of his people. He shows his strength on behalf of you and behalf of me. See, I think, I think many believers don't know this kind of power because they don't see them walking in it. Or they only know it maybe from a distance. See, God wants resurrection life to be real in the life of the believer. Resurrection life. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He didn't stay dead, if you remember. He's our living, living God. His power. Resurrection God. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, 1800s British pastor said, the very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunkard from his drunkenness. To raise the thief from his dishonesty. To raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness. To raise the Sadducee from his unbelief. Put your name in there. To raise from, right? I want to go to some notes on my phone that I wrote down because the Bible, throughout the Bible, it refers to God's power quite often as it relates to you and I as a believer. For instance, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power, dynamite, omnipotence of his might. Philippians 1.6, I'm sure many of you might know this one. Being confident in this, that he who has begun a good work in you will do what? He's going to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. Absolutely, that's in his power. My mom used to say to me, oh, Margo, you can come kicking and screaming if you want to, but he will complete it but he will complete it. So good. Colossians 1, 29. Paul says, I also labor, he's talking about himself, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Okay, so are you following this? He's laboring, right? He's striving. I also labor striving, but he's striving according to his working. 
He's striving according to God's working, which works in me mightily. He's not doing this in the flesh. He's not trying to this, this, this. He would fail every time. He's striving, he's laboring, but he's doing it in and through his power. His power. God's power is sufficient for every need. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? For every need. If you don't, you're at a crisis of belief for our every need. See, but those of us who don't make use of God's available power, you know what we do? We live miserable, defeated lives. That's not why he died for you and lives for you. You're already seated in the heavenlies. He didn't come so that you could live a miserable, defeated life. He said, I came to give you life and more life, abundant life, life to the full. Right now, to walk in my power. He doesn't want you to be some curmudgeon Christian. There's no power in that. There's no attraction in that. People are like, I don't want to be around her. Right? We're supposed to be appealing to people. It's his power in us. It doesn't mean we're not going through big stuff at times. We are. He says, take heart. I've overcome the world. There is trouble. It's fallen world stuff. The girl I was just talking to you about when we were praying and praying and praying, walking around Fowler Lake, we're praying for her aunt, and she was getting better and getting better and getting better, and the next day she called me. She said, Margo, we were praying and praying for her, and guess what? She moved to heaven. Fallen world stuff. But we walk in power. We walk in his power. Not living miserable, defeated lives. Walking on our feelings because this is a good day and this isn't. Or this person said this or this, this. Or my kid did this or not. Or I have finances or that. No. Not at all. There's more than enough power to break the hold of our sinful habits. More than enough to give us deliverance from temptation. I mean, what does he tell us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? When temptation comes along, that isn't sin. When you give into it, it is. But he says, I've given you a way out. You don't have to give into it. I've given you power to escape that. Choose it. Choose my power. Yield to me. Choose my power. God's power is made available to us by his indwelling presence, right? The Holy Spirit. And we need to yield now. Yield now. Yield now. Yield now. And the more you know him, the more you know your calling, the more that you know that you are this amazing trophy of grace, inheritance to God. Why wouldn't you want to yield now? You're a new creation in him. The old is gone. The new has come. You have power, resurrection power, and all authority because you're seated in the heavenlies with him as well, he said, right now. And if everything is under Jesus Christ's feet, which it is, everything is underneath your feet. And you can walk in the power and authority, the dynamite power that he has in you, but you need to yield to him. It's not your power. You try it in your power, you're, you're sunk. You're sunk. Like Paul said, what did he say? He said, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. He's not saying that we aren't supposed to labor at this. It's, it, it can be hard work. But you know that he's working in you mightily. He's your deliverer. He will either deliver you in it or out of it. But either way, you're delivered. He's absolutely your delivered, or your deliverer. Hebrews uh, 13, 21, he says, to make you mature in every good work to do his will, working in you, which is well-pleasing in his sight. So we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who is working in us, which is well-pleasing in his sight as we yield to him. Moment by moment by moment. There's one condition that must be met 
before God's power can be displayed. We must know that the greatness of his power is only to those who believe. Only those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because if you don't, the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you. So it's only to us who believe. And then we walk in that power. God's power is limited in us only by the faith or trust that we have in Jesus Christ. See, the more you get to know him, the easier it is to walk in his power. Because you know he'll never fail you. Because you know that he has his best plans for you. His best plans for you. Not yours. His. He knows that, you know, you're walking through this time because it's going to bring you back to him. Or you're walking through this time because it's going to, um, your response to it is going to show other people glory, his glory. Or it's going to be productive in your own life. And you're going to become more and more like him and less like our future selves. That's what Paul was praying. That you'd know your calling. What a great calling we have. That you would know that God looks at us as an inheritance, that we're trophies of his grace. And that we would walk with this exceedingly great power to those of us who believe. He didn't leave us on this world to live a miserable, defeated life. He gave us the Holy Spirit, who is our power, as we yield moment by moment by moment. Same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. Next week, we're going to go into um, this description of the great power of God that Paul wants the Ephesians to know, and we're actually going to go into what that power is, resurrection, exaltation, lordship, and headship in our lives. And so we're going to go into how we walk in that power. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, mm. thank you, Jesus. Thank you that Paul thought that it was extremely important to pray for the believers to know this, for spiritual growth. That the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. And if, if Paul believed it was important to pray these things for the Ephesian Christians then, it's just as important for us to pray them for others and for ourselves. Lord, take your living, active words and just mold us and make us. We're the clay, you're the potter. Just mold us and make us more and more like you. We have such a high calling. We have such a privilege to walk through this world knowing you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in your suffering, and becoming like you in death, so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. God, help us to know you more. Help us to have that desire to know you more. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who illuminates our mind and tells us all truth, knows us more than we know ourselves. Thank you that no matter what we're going through in this world, whatever circumstance it is, that it's already done in the heavenlies. And that we can just keep our eyes fixed on you because you are our author and you are our perfecter of our faith. And so Jesus, we love you. Take us through the week. Lord, put in our hearts who to invite to a candlelight Christmas, God. 
Because the light of the world is here now. It's not has come. It's here now. It's here now. And Lord, I just ask that time. Um, you would just open the floodgates of women and ready their hearts that they would want to come and enjoy a night of song, a night of teaching, a night of hot drinks and sweet treats and, and all kinds of, of fun and faith and fellowship, but all because of you. All because of you. So thank you, Jesus, for Christmas. Thank you that you did step out of eternity into time as a human being so that you would die for us, so that we could live now and forever and in that power. So Lord, we give you praise and we give you honor because we love you to pieces. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen.